It's one of the most common questions we get here at Fishful Thinker. Hey man, that technique looks really cool, but can I use it from the bank? Well, we're going to talk about all sorts of things related to fishing from the bank on this episode of Fishful Thinker, the podcast. I'm Chad Lachance, and you're listening to Fishful Thinker, the podcast. All things fishful, all the time. Hey guys, Chad Lachance here. I appreciate you tuning in once again to this episode of Fishful Thinker, the podcast. Of course, brought to you by Sportsman's Warehouse. As always, now before we even get started on this podcast, because I think it's going to be, uh, it's going to be an interesting topic. It's uh, it's something that I think is important to get out there, and that's all the bank fishing details. But before we get going too much into it, I have to give you one apology real quick, and that is I'm a little bit under the weather again this week, and uh, it's been ongoing for a while, so my voice may not be quite as clear as I would like it to be. But uh, hopefully you'll hang in there and the information will make it worth your while anyway. So bank fishing, big deal. <clears throat> I love to bank fish. It doesn't come across in our television show very much. We've done 330 some episodes of Fishful Thinker Television, but only a small handful of those outside of river fishing have been from the bank. We've done some pond shows. Uh, we've done some uh, on reservoir as well, a couple of them. Uh, but for the most part, we're in the boat. We're in some sort of a boat, whether it be a kayak, a paddle board, uh, you know, the, obviously the big ranger boat or my little hot rod Coleman Crawdad or whatever the case might be, drifting the rivers in the boats or rafts. We've done that. But we don't typically film a lot from the bank. And, and really, that's on me. I, it's, that's, a, that's really a mistake on my behalf. <clears throat> and maybe going forward, you'll see a little bit more bank fishing shows. Because when I was thinking through this podcast, somewhere I was thinking, man, we really should put a little bit more of this on film. It seems like it would be a good thing to do. So we're going to talk about some of the details of how I approach bank fishing. And real quick, I want to point out that I live lakefront. I'm a very lucky guy. I live with a lake, uh, a 2,000 acre lake in the backyard. So I can walk down bank fish whenever I want, and most people have no idea that I go bank fishing as much as I do, but I bank fish quite a bit, and it's almost a daily thing for me, even if it's only for 10 minutes at a time. I have a Labrador retriever. He likes to swim. That's a good excuse to go for a walk real quick down the bank and see what I can catch. So even though it doesn't come across on my guide trips or on television or anything else, I do a lot of bank fishing, and like the vast majority of you, I grew up bank fishing before I ever had any boats. So I didn't get my own boat until I was 25 years old, 24 years old that I get my first boat and then went from there. And I'm 50 something now. We don't have to talk about that. But uh, but at any rate, the, I have a lot of experience on fishing from the bank as well. And I think that's that's important to keep in mind. So I wanted to run through some, some fundamental stuff that I do that I focus on to maximize my chances of catching fish from the bank and more importantly having a good time while I am doing that. So let's start with uh, with some of that stuff and we'll go from there. And of course as always if you have questions or follow up on any of this information feel free to email me chat at fishfulthinker.com and I would be oh so ha happy to answer your questions as soon as I can. So <clears throat> let's go from there and again I apologize for being a little bit under the weather. Let's start with Bank Fishing 101. First of all, if you're a fan of Fishful Thinker, you know I always have multiple rods on the deck of the boat. It's very rare that I have only one fishing rod with me. And that does not change when I go bank fishing. Typically, I will bring in at least two of them, no matter what. And usually, when I'm bank fishing, I'll bring three. And the reason I bring multiple rods is for a couple reasons. One, I can present a wider range of baits. The rods are never the same length, power, and action. Now, in the boat situation, I might have two or three identical rods on the deck of the boat, uh, but it's easier for me to do that. If I'm on the bank, I don't, you, you don't want to carry as much stuff, and we'll talk more about that in a minute because that will inhibit your ability to move around, and that's going to be really important. So I bring rods that are different, and depending on what I'm doing, they could be a medium light, a medium, and a medium heavy. They might be, you know, who knows, any, any combination of lens powers and actions of rods, or maybe two different kinds of line. Maybe I've got one set up for topwater fishing and one set up for bottom fishing. 
So maybe one's got braid and one's got mono on it, or one's got fluoro, one's got mono, whatever the case might be. But I always bring multiple rods. The other reason that I bring multiple rods whenever I'm bank fishing is because what if you break a rod or what if you tangle a reel or something goes wrong with one of those rods or reels? I don't want to ruin my whole outing, particularly if I've walked, you know, a half mile down the bank of some reservoir somewhere. I don't want to be done just because I tangled a reel up and I don't have extra line with me. In the boat, I would have extra line anyway. On the bank, that's rare. So I have the extra rod so that I can continue to fish in the event that I make a mistake and tangle up a bunch of line or whatever the case might be in that regard. So a couple of rods for sure. <clears throat> Along the lines with those rods, I don't bring my fanciest rods. If, if, if I'm going to go bank fishing, I have my least expensive rods with me almost always. Because when you're on the bank, you have way more chance of damaging your tackle. On the deck of the boat, the rods are laid out in a nice carpeted boat, or even in my little crawdad, they're in a carpeted deal, or they're in a rod holder if we're in the kayak. On the bank, they're going to potentially be set down in the dirt. They're going to be leaned up against a tree or a willow bush, something like that. Uh, in general, they just have more chance of getting broken. And the more expensive rods are, as a general rule, the more fragile they are. So I tend to bring my least expensive tackle with me whenever I go bank fishing. And I feel like that that gives me a little bit more confidence to move around a bunch. The other thing I do for bank fishing as far as tackle goes, and I don't want to go too much into tackle stuff uh, because that's a personal thing, but I want to go more into techniques. But the other thing I do for tackle is I will minimize uh, the amount of tackle I carry for one, but also minimize the amount of spares I carry. I would rather have one of, of each of 10 different lures than to have two or three of one that's limiting my ability to carry more variety because... At the end of the day, most bank fishing trips aren't going to be all day affairs. And if you lose the one lure that, that the fish were biting, well, you can maybe make up for it or whatever. So I don't carry spares with me. I don't carry spare line with me when I'm bank fishing. I try to keep it a lot more simple in that regard. The other thing I don't do for bank fishing very much is carry a lot of really distinctly bottom contact baits, baits that have to be right on the bottom or that are designed to be right on the bottom unless I know that I'm fishing in an area that isn't particularly snaggy. My home lake is extremely snaggy, like broken rock everywhere, and it will snag everything. Therefore, you will drive yourself crazy and you will get gun shy about making good presentations if you're constantly snagging and you can't get them back. So you'll spend a lot of money, you'll spend a lot of time and frustration doing that. So I tend to modify my techniques or focus on techniques that aren't quite as bottom uh, intense, so to speak. If I am going to bring bottom contact baits, they're going to be less expensive than normal. Um, cheaper baits, simpler jig heads, things like that, because for the same reason, I don't have the opportunity to get them back a lot of the times. And in a boat, I can usually get right on top of the bait and I can get the overwhelming majority of them back. From the bank, that may not be the case. Now, if you say you do want to be a more advanced bank angler and you do want to make sure you get your lures back, the other possibility is to get a, a Fraybill telescoping plug retriever that will reach out, I believe they're 15, they might be 18, I think they're 15 feet long, and it's telescoping. It's no heavier than a golf ball retriever like a golfer would carry in his bag. I can reach 15 feet off the bank and get hard plugs, particularly is what I'm referencing here, back. So a crankbait, a jerk bait, you know, something like that. And the reason that's important is the when you're on, standing on the bank, your retrieves are always uphill. The bait's coming up the hill to you. Uh, that's the way the bottom of the lake works, right? So their chances of them snagging are greatest when they're close to you. So you can get a fair number of them back if you have that plug retriever. So that's something else I carry. I tend to like to carry my stuff in a backpack, uh, something I continuously move with. And I've got a portable rod holder that they snap into so that I can leave it standing on end or lay it down so that the rods themselves aren't laying on the dirt. And there's no faster way to break a rod than to scratch the edges or scratch the blank itself and disrupt the hoop strength of the rod. So I carry a, a portable rod holder that will hold up to six, although I never really have more than three. Uh, 
on the bank, but it will carry those rods for you so you can set the other two down that you're not fishing with without damaging them as well. So keep the tackle simple. I keep my pliers in my pocket no different than if I have, I'm in the boat. They are strapped to my pocket all the time. I still have my hand towel on one side. I still wear my polarized glasses all the time, all the time, not part of the time, all of the time. All the fundamentals still are in play. I'm watching my line. All that stuff is still in play. <clears throat> I just simplify the tackle and the amount of stuff that I carry a whole bunch because, and this is a big point, when I go bank fishing, it's very rare for me to fish one spot more than just a few minutes. Unless I've just got a really good spot or it's the only spot available to me, I'm going to move around a whole bunch. Just for the record, I don't like to ice fish. It's not my thing. I grew up in Florida. Ice fishing is not for me. But when I ice fish, I take a lot of these same principles. I don't carry a ton of stuff, and I move around a lot. I drill a lot of holes. Same thing with the bank. I want to move around a lot. I'm not one that wants to sit and let fish come to me. There's more often than not that does not pan out in the time frame I have. I would rather go actively seek them out. So by making my tackle portable, it's going to let me catch more fish. And again, I'm, I might give a spot, to, unless I'm just waylaying fish, I, I will give a spot maybe 10 minutes tops, and I'm going to move. And I might only move 20 yards or 20 feet even, or I might move a quarter of a mile, depending on fundamentally what I'm looking at. But I want to be able to move around on the bank and, uh, and cover as much water as I can. No different than when I'm in my boat, whether I'm on a guide trip or filming. I cover a lot of water in the boat on most days. I do the same thing from the bank. So that's another key thing is be portable when you're fishing from the bank. Now, along those same lines, the reason I want to be, or part of the reason I want to be so portable is I want to be able to really mix up my casting angles. And I can always tell how experienced somebody is or isn't bank fishing when I watch them here behind my house and where they walk down the bank because I'll see a guy I'll walk up to a good spot and then he'll just launch a lure 50 yards straight out in the middle of the lake well I don't do that in the boat I don't do that in the float tube or the kayak why would I do that from the bank the reality of the situation is the majority of the fish you want to catch are going to be in the littoral zone of the lake in other words somewhere reasonably close to the bank now Somebody's going to call me out on that, and of course, there's exceptions to that. There's fish that swim open water all the time, lake trout may be way out there, whatever the case might be, just even regular trout may be out cruising, or if you're on a flat bank, maybe fish are cruising way out off the bank and you need to throw to them. But if I'm on an average western reservoir type situation, I'm going to go to Horsetooth Reservoir here in Colorado. The banks are relatively steep. So my casting angles are going to be tight to the bank. So I'm going to throw potentially right down the bank. I mean like a couple of feet off the bank. And then I'm going to make my next cast exactly opposite a couple of feet off the bank. And then I'll switch back directions and make my next one maybe five feet off the bank. And I'll just go back and forth and back and forth until I cover a whole big fan-shaped piece of water in front of me. Now, if I get multiple bites on one angle... I will continue to exploit that angle. But until I know that, I'm going to make a lot of casting angles. And it doesn't matter if I'm bass fishing or walleye fishing or trout fishing or whatever the case might be. I'm going to mix up my casting angles a lot. And <clears throat> excuse me, it may even be that there's fish right in front of me, literally you know, rod length or two off the bank right in front of me, but the way to get a presentation to them is to walk away from that spot and cast back to it so that I can retrieve a bait through there at an angle. That may be the right answer uh, in a lot of scenarios as well. And that's one I very commonly run into when fishing big isolated rocks, which are around the reservoir that I happen to live on. So ideally, I want to fish around this big rock, but I can't go stand on that rock. I need to stand away from it and throw past it and then maybe walk all the way around the other side of it and throw past it the other way Again, mixing up my casting angles. And I'm so big on casting angles, guys, that there's an entire podcast. If you're a subscriber, you might have seen it. I've done a whole podcast on nothing but casting angles because I believe casting angles catch you more fish, paying attention to your casting angles than a lot of other things. And on the bank, it can be really important because the steepness of the bank coming up to you may affect how long your bait is or isn't in the strike zone. And by changing up the angles, you can learn that. 
The steeper a bank is, the tighter to the bank I fish. The flatter a bank is, the farther from the bank I will fish, or the more open-minded, at least in, in that regard, I will be. So if I'm in a really flat bank, I might be throwing stuff way out, you know, out in open water, what appears to be, because the water's only five or six feet deep out of the end of that cast. Conversely, I've got banks right here at my home lake where if you throw out the end of the cast, it's going to land and I mean, make just an average throw with a spinning rod at straight out. It's going to land in 50 feet of water or more. That's not going to be an ideal scenario for catching most of the fish. And therefore, I'm not going to do that very often. So it just depends a little bit on the steepness of your bank. And there again, that goes back to mobility. So no different in the boat. When I'm trying different things, trying to figure out how to get fish to, to bite on any given day, I might fish a steep bank, a flat bank, and an intermediate bank. Same thing if I'm on the, on the on, you know, standing on the bank. I might try, first of all, a flatter bank. Then I might try a really steep bank, and that means I might need to walk a ways. Understood. I might even need to get back in my tundra and drive a half mile to a different parking spot and get out. That's something I commonly do. Uh, whatever the case might be, I'm, I'm looking for ways to mix up my presentations and my cover and structure types no different than if I was in the boat. It's a matter of being mobile and being willing to move and change in a hurry and uh, fishing with an open mind. And that's a key thing right there. So I'm going to mix up stuff as possible. Another key thing for bank fishing, if you really want to catch the most fish bank fishing, I'm always going to go where the wind's blowing in on the bank. Same again with the boat. If I'm going to start there anyway. Unless the wind's blowing so hard that I just can't fish there, if I'm looking for a place to fish, I'm going to start where the wind is blowing on or at least down the bank that I'm on. I don't want to go seek out a sheltered bank. I'd be the first to admit that's a nice place to sit. I, too, love to sit lakeside and enjoy a nice you know, afternoon out of the wind. However, this is a fishing podcast, and I want you to catch fish. And to catch more fish, you're most likely going to do that on the bank that the wind is blowing on. Along those same lines, if I'm looking for a place to fish, I'm going to look for a spot where there may be a mud line forming, where the wind is blowing on the bank, or boat traffic, or foot traffic, as the case might be, is washing the bank around a little bit, and it's starting to get some mud or some silt stirred up. Great place to fish. Always going to look for that. Along those same lines, I'm always looking for herons, or... Um, kingfishers or seagulls that are actively feeding, not roosted ones, those are going to give me a clue as where to start fish as well. And if I walk up and there's a heron on the bank, I, my confidence level goes through the roof because I know that there's small fish there that that heron's going to eat. And therefore, there's going to be other fish there that maybe I want to eat. So I'm going to look for various cues, mud lines, wind blowing on it, birds coming on it, uh, if the lake's got really hard banks and there's no mud, I want to see the current ripping down the bank if at all possible. And here's one that almost nobody thinks about for bank fishing. Go to the boat ramp. <clears throat> the reason being is that's usually the busiest place on the lake. That's also a lot of the times where uh, fish are stocked in that lake. So there's always a certain percentage of fish that hang out around there. If you're in an area where they do bass or walleye tournaments, particularly bass tournaments, a lot of times fish are released right around the boat ramps. So fishing around boat ramps is one of the best things a guy can do. Now, as a boater and a bank angler, understand it's a boat ramp first. Don't be blocking guys coming in and out in their trucks and trailers, uh, boats trying to come in, any of the cases like that, particularly a non-fishing vessel that isn't going to recognize the situation like a pontoon boat or a party boat. Is your responsibility to stay out of their way. It is a boat ramp first and foremost, whether I'm fishing it from the boat or from the bank. I always fish boat ramps, and I advocate that you as well. And when I say boat ramps, I mean either right on the concrete or right down the edge of the ramp or the riprap that forms a wave barrier around a boat ramp or the tire barrier, as the case might be. Whatever the situation is, the docks themselves uh, will give some overhanging cover, the courtesy docks. Also a good scenario. So boat ramps are an excellent place to go from the bank. And they typically obviously have parking and everything else right there. So, And bathrooms even, which can be convenient. So uh, fishing around boat ramps is, a, is a, one of the key things I'll look for when I'm trying to choose where to fish uh, from the bank. Another place, 
Uh, we talked about these in the boat as well. Dams are really good if you can get on the corner of the dams. Keep in mind it's not legal in a lot of reservoirs after the Patriot Act. If it's legal, fishing around dams can be really good, and even better than that can be inlets if they're running. And here in northern Colorado, there's uh, almost an underground cult that goes on when the various reservoirs start to fill. And it's usually a ditch of some sort that fills them. Uh, these are not rivers running into these, these smaller irrigation reservoirs. They're ditches. They're run by ditch companies. And whenever they open the valve and start pouring water into whatever lake it is we're talking about, and, and literally it will take only a matter of hours and anglers will show up. I mean, the word will get out in a hurry. And the reason being, when they turn those ditches on, all kinds of fish are going to pile in there in a hurry to that, to that running water. Uh, no different than if you were out in the boat, you want to go there from the bank as well. <clears throat> and the key might be to fish as farther up in that ditch as you think you can. That's a common one or in the alluvial fan, uh, in other words, where the water's coming in and it's bringing sediment, debris, uh, whatever comes out with that running water, fishing around the mouth of that. But that's another spot I'm always going to look for uh, when I'm fishing from the bank is going to be to go fish from a dam. Another key thing that I'll look for for a spot to fish from the bank is going to be major points sticking out into the lake or jetties sticking out of the lake, anything like that. And in a lot of those scenarios, I'll walk out to the end of that jetty or part of the way out and then cast back to the bank that it's sticking out of because, again, the fish are in the littoral zone. A lot of bass and walleyes and trout and everybody else will run down that bank and uh, can be a really, really excellent way to catch them is to walk out on anything that sticks out off the bank and then turn around and throw back to it. And what I see here behind my house is guys walk out on the point sticking out in the lake and then they throw straight out off the end of it as far as they can instead of turning around and fishing the, the point they just walked out on. And the ironic part is the guy in the boat, he pulls up in that point and he starts fishing all the, the part of the point that you're standing on. And, uh, and so I guess that goes back to the grass is always greener. But at the end of the day, if you can get out and throw back at the bank somewhere, that's a good call. Also an inside turn in the bank. So you're on a concave turn in the bank. Again, we'll let you throw down the bank or into the bank and retrieve out, retrieve the opposite direction. Can be a really good call uh, as well. Anytime you get inside turn in the bank will be an excellent call. Uh, another thing I look for uh, from the bank, particularly in any sort of reservoir that I can get around on in a lot of the ponds around town, and that is beaver huts. Beaver huts, beavers will do a good job of making sure there's deep water access. So if there's a beaver hut there, he has access to the main basin of that lake all the time, including winter when the lake is frozen. So there's going to be deep water right there. And fishing around a beaver hut is a fantastic way to up your odds when you're fishing from the bank, all other things being equal. So I will go to a beaver hut and fish out in front of it a whole bunch. Now, let me give you a caution. I don't have to tell you that beaver huts are made out of sticks and sticks are snaggy. So if I'm going to fish a beaver hut, it's typically going to be with something that's either inexpensive or extremely snag proof, one or the other, uh, or I'm going to fish high up in the column above it. So for instance, let's say it's a bass pond somewhere in town. Maybe I'll run a spinner bait by that thing, uh, you know, and if I feel it hit any sticks or anything like that, I'll maybe throw it a little bit deeper. Uh, the other possibility is to drag some sort of a plastic worm around it where if you lose it, it's not the end of the world. Or even better is to throw a topwater bait over the, right along the beaver hut itself, and you might be surprised. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. But the beaver hut concept is a really excellent way to catch a lot of fish as well, and it's something that a lot of the ponds around my hometown have. And I suspect a lot of you are in the Western United States. You might find the same thing as well. And no, I don't live up in the mountains. The ponds I'm talking about are on the plains. So that's another thing that I, I recommend from the bank uh, is to fish the beaver huts. Also culvert pipes of any kind. I remember when I was a young kid, the pond I used to go to in Metro Denver had one big culvert that stuck way out. It was like a two-foot diameter tube stuck like five feet out into the pond. And I used to go to that thing first thing in the morning, and we're going to get back to that in a second as well, run a bait by the end of that culvert pipe, and it would be bit instantaneously. So uh, really good call. 
<coughs> excuse me, once again, guys, I'm going to have to cut this one short, having a hard time talking. But one more point that I think is really important for bank fishing if you want to maximize your odds. And that's going to be fish, fish, fish early, early, and late in the day, if at all possible. If you can go out really early before work, that's going to be great. If you can go out really late, right before dark, that's going to be great. If you have to go out in the middle of the day, hey, I get it. That Go do it. But your best chance is going to be early and late in the day, particularly if you're looking for larger than average fish. And even better still is at night. And a very common email for me is, I want to catch walleyes from the bank. The first line in my response is always to fish in the dark. So if you can... <clears throat> excuse me, if you can get sprung and go fish in the dark, I'm going to strongly recommend that you do that. Even more importantly, at that point, avoid a headlamp because if you're strobing a headlamp in the water a whole bunch, you're not going to catch a lot of fish. They're going to turn into that and it's not going to be good. So avoid a light if at all possible. If you do have a light, have it be subtle and don't shine it in the water any more than you absolutely have to. Uh, if you do shine it in the water, maybe rest your spot for a few minutes. And if you really need a light, maybe go ahead and set a lantern type deal that doesn't move and just let it sit there for maybe 15 or 20 minutes before you start fishing. And then what you might find out is you've drawn fish to your spot on the bank because of the light in the water We'll get bugs, which will get bait, blah, 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 food chain. So fishing from the bank in the dark is your best chance of catching some really big fish. And I've often argued that there could be some case that some of the biggest fish caught are, that are ever caught off a lake are caught in the dark. And bank fishermen are sneakier than people in boats. If I'm in a 3,000-pound boat and it's barging a bunch of water along, even if it's barely moving... It's sending out pressure waves that fish will feel. But if you're on the bank and you're sneaky and you're quiet and you're not rolling rocks around as you're walking, you're not stomping around in your feet, and you're not shining lights in the water, you have a really, really good chance of catching big bass and big walleyes and big trout uh, from the bank. And if you want to catch the biggest brown trout you've ever seen, go night fishing. You want to catch a big walleye, go night fishing. You want to catch a big largemouth in a heavily pressured pond right in the middle of town, Show up there at 2 in the morning if that fits your schedule, and you might be surprised at what kind of fish live in those ponds. But again, you have to be sneaky. You have to focus on your angles. You have to maybe be a little bit portable, and you have to you know, really concentrate on uh, moving around and keeping an open mind as you move. So <clears throat> with that, my voice is giving out. I wasn't sure if I was going to make it even to this far, but I have, and I apologize. I appreciate you guys hanging in there with me as, as my voice has gone away. Hopefully, I'll get this gone before next week's podcast. We'll be doing good, but this is the third week in a row that I'm struggling talking, and for a guy that talks for a living, that's not a good sign. So please, please, please consider subscribing to any of our social media, actually, at Fishful Thinker. That's going to be Facegram, Instagram, or Facebook, I should say, Instagram, or for sure YouTube. Uh, lots and lots of videos there, all instructional-based stuff we'd really like you guys to tune into. And, of course, we're on Altitude Sports and World Fishing Network uh, lots of times each week. So if you get either one of those, check us out there. Look us up, Fishful Thinker, there. But till then, guys, thanks for your patience with my voice. And get out do some bank fishing, take some kids, uh, whatever the case might be. But... Stay portable, simplify your tackle, be sneaky, keep an open mind, focus on high percentage spots, and you'll catch plenty of fish. So, thanks for tuning in. This has been Fishful Thinker, the podcast.